All right, Ravina, you are now live streaming and I'll give you that host. All right, have a great class. Hi, Elizabeth. Welcome to class. Thank you. How are you today? I'm doing great. Yeah, it's Friday. Sun, <laughs> sun is shining, so I'm happy about that. That's the same thing. It's a bright, sunny day. Mm -hmm. the, temperature, the temperature is a little lower than it should be in May, but it's not yeah. cold. It is a little bit chilly. I went out on my balcony to water my plants and I thought, okay, the sun's shiny, but it still still is a bit cold for me. But not going to complain because the uh, plants are starting to grow, which is nice. Welcome, Sherry. All right. I don't know how many Thank people you. were going to... Hi. I don't know how many people were actually going to have a class today. Um, somehow I think this class was delete or canceled and then restarted again. So it, we may not have gotten that many people, but in any event, we are live streaming this class. So it will reach many more people, uh, which is nice. And so hello to everybody in class, whether you're in the registered class or you're out there. We have John today um, in our chat to help us with support. 
So feel free to reach out to him and ask him any questions or if you need any help with, uh, with anything. I'm going to try and have the chat box open so that I can see what's going on. And if you have questions that I'm able to um, take a look and, and answer those questions for you. Uh, but uh, why don't we get started and anybody who's joining us a little bit late can just uh, sort of catch up from where we are. So today's class is on optimal brain health, which is awesome. It's great to get our brains, keep our brains in check, have our brains feeling happy. Uh, you know, our brains are an important organ in our body. So today we're really going to... Uh, um, unpack what dementia actually is and how does it differ from other other things that we hear of that are used in in place of the word dementia and what can we do to lower our risk of getting dementia that's a really big one a lot of us do worry about you know as we age does that mean we're going to get dementia so if you haven't met me before, my name is Ravina. I'm one of the guides here at Get Set Up. And I've been working now for since beginning of, of February. I've been teaching classes and it's been really fun. I've gotten to know a lot of you. I know Elizabeth. I see Elizabeth in a lot of my classes. She's she's obviously interested in health and wellness. And there's such a great variety of classes. Uh, I took a class uh, the other day on learning how to make sauces, spicy sauces. That was really interesting. And I want to take one of the, um, the morning classes, like I'd like to try Tai Chi. Has anybody in the class tried Tai Chi? Uh, one of our guys is teaching that. So I, I don't know, I just seems kind of interesting. And it's kind of like our own university, Get Set Up University. So my focus has always been on health and wellness. So that's, that's my love, my passion. And I love to teach and mentor others with their health and wellness. We do learn from each other, including the guide. I always learn so much from all of you. So keep asking your questions, keep on um, giving us your, your tiny little stories so we can all learn from each other and feel, um, feel connected to each other. I think that's important. And we are taping, uh, we do record the class. John, if I've forgotten to hit the record button, I can't see it now that I'm sharing the screen. Can you hit the record button for me? And we are live streaming a lot of our classes. So if you haven't tried looking at a live stream class, you just go to the Get Set Up website and you go down the left-hand side and there's a little icon that says TV. Click it. Now you're not going to be on TV, but you click it and you get a, a live stream into whatever class they're live streaming at the moment. And you get to hear it. You get to see it. You don't get to see the chat box, but you, you really can get a flavor of whether you like that class or not they cannot see you they don't know that you're watching so honestly there could be a uh, hundred people live streaming right now we don't even know um yes ty arnold he does the tai chi for beginners so that's definitely i might see it some of you in that class and then lastly just want to mention about you know we don't really we have partnerships with with companies but we we, we don't get um <clears throat> kickbacks or anything like that for products or services i might talk about and i do on occasion talk about a product or service especially if somebody asks me a question about something so just keep that in mind all right let's get started now who we're going to learn the difference between dementia and alzheimer's disease because we hear those interchangeable a lot of the time there's a reason kind of for it and we'll get into it we're going to understand the risk factors for dementia that are in our control because you know, I'll mention the two that are out of our control, but we might as well look at what do I have control of? We will learn some optimal brain health food, which I think is uh, great to know what our brain, what our brain would like, and some body practices that will fuel exercise and train our brains. And that's important as well. It's sort of like lose it, use it or lose it. That whole idea with muscles and anything like that. So our brain is one of, you know, it's, it's an organ in our body and it's, it's a, it's like a muscle. So we'll, we'll talk about that. So in starting the class, I'm just curious, do, do, does anybody here know how many different types of dementia there are out there? Like in today's society, and they, they probably have uh, come up with new ones. I know one of the more recent ones is um, an autoimmune dementia. 
Uh, any ideas how many dementia, types of dementia we have? No? This is really surprising. There's actually over 400 types of dementia. I thought that was crazy. That couldn't, that can't be, there can't be, you know, there's like a hundred types of arthritis. Like I thought, okay, maybe on the high end, a hundred types, but there's actually over 400 types of dementia. That was startling to me. I like, I had no idea. Can you guess, or do you know what the most common type of dementia there is out there? Anybody? Well, I kind of have, yes, that's right, Elizabeth. You're right. That's, I kind of like hinted at it because I wanted to talk about it. Because a lot of times a person has Alzheimer's, but we just say, oh, they have dementia. Or somebody who has a type of dementia, not Alzheimer's, we just say, oh, they have Alzheimer's. And they're not the same thing. So think of dementia as an umbrella term. And when we say umbrella, it's sort of like an umbrella. So the dementia is up here. And then below it are all those 400 types that go across. Now, the only difference between them going across is that Alzheimer's takes up 60 to 80% of that space. If you can visualize, easier to visualize it. We have a lot of Alzheimer's. Now, um, what else to say about it? It's just a word that we use interchangeably. It's like we say Kleenex for a tissue for to wipe our nose, say for example, tissue is, uh, it, Kleenex is a brand, but I say, can you pass the Kleenex? But we all know what we mean. It, you know, when we say Alzheimer's, we might just say, oh, that person has dementia. Well, technically they do have dementia, but it's a specific type of dementia called Alzheimer's. You wouldn't tell a dementia patient, you wouldn't call them, oh, they have Alzheimer's because maybe they have something different. How about a guess for the second most common type of dementia? This one trips people up, but when you hear it, then you, then you, then you realize. Any other, can you think of any other uh, types of dementia that you've heard of? Probably if you've heard of it, it's one of the higher end ones. So the second most common is vascular dementia. We might not hear that, we might just hear the word that person has dementia, but this is typically when somebody has had a stroke, a pretty significant stroke where there's been oxygen deprivation to the brain you then can develop this type of dementia called vascular dementia. It's very common. Uh, second, I don't know what the percentages are. I mean, obviously Alzheimer's is the highest, but this is second. So, you know, we often, we go through life and we say, oh, wow, there's some dementia in my family. Gosh, I hope I don't get dementia. It might be hereditary. Well, what if it's the people in your family that have dementia have vascular dementia? which is very directly related to their environment and their lifestyle. So if your environment and lifestyle is very different, that, that doesn't mean you have any higher risk of, of dementia than say your neighbor. So that leads me to this question where I, I like to pose it, but do you feel that dementia is, is part of normal aging? Does it feel like it? It probably feels like it's part of normal aging, but do you think that's true? Yes. Because we see it, it's so popular. It's so popular. The older we get, the more at risk we are for dementia. That's a fact. As we age, the more at risk we are for dementia. But the truth of the matter is, is that dementia is not part of our normal aging. It just isn't part of it. In fact, most of us will have good memories, um, be cognitively sound throughout our lives until we pass. Uh, you know, maybe the movies don't, focus on that. Maybe um, the, the stories that we remember are, you know, anti so-and-so who, you know, started to lose her mind. We used to use the word senile. Um, what are some other words? That's sort of a word we don't really use very much because, you know, the person's basically losing their mind. So we say, oh, they're senile. Don't worry about her. But really, for the majority of us, we will have our minds intact when we pass. And that makes me happy because I think I could handle a, a physical thing that's going on with me and, you know, and maybe eventually I pass from that, but I certainly don't want to be with my husband 
in those days, latter days, and I'm losing my mind. And now I don't even recognize him. Like to me, that just is so, so sad. You see those in that in movies and, and you just feel sickened. Don't you, you think like, how could I forget who my daughter is or not recognize when my son walks in the room? So most of us don't want to get dementia. Like it's a huge, huge thing. Um, but what I will say, because, and this comes up when I ask about the types of dementia, people say, oh, age-related dementia. So the truth is, it's actually called age-associated memory loss. And it is a real thing, age-associated memory loss. It's not a dementia. And around 40% of us, once we hit the age of 65, will have some form of memory impairment. So, you know, maybe our memory is not as sharp as it was when we were 20. But still, it's only 40% of us that are going to see this sort of, hmm, my memory is just not what it used to be. So that leaves 60% of us that, you know, after age 65, hey, we still we still got it. You know, it's very sharp. It's it's good. Okay. Um, so the next thing I want to mention is, now before I answer this question, I want to share a little study with you. And they've, they've, they've done a survey over and over again. And this is quite, um, well, let's just say, it's surprising yet it's not surprising. They do surveys and they ask a group of people different ages, would you rather get Alzheimer's or cancer? And guess what the, mo the majority of the answers are? Think of it for yourself, even, um, you know, cancer can be scary, right? You can die from cancer. But most people have said they'd rather get cancer than Alzheimer's because people don't want to lose their, their cognitive ability. So that just tells you a little bit about, you know, how worried many of us uh, worry about uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. And that's why this class is so important. Actually, this is the very first class I created for Get Set Up when I started because I, I thought about what do I get asked the most? What What's the question I get asked the most? And it's always about brain health and, and to do with cognitive and, and dementia and Alzheimer's. One of the most frequently asked questions I get is, I have a family member with Alzheimer's. Does that mean I'm doomed to get it? Is that, do you think, what do you think of that? Do you think if you have somebody in your family that has Alzheimer's, that means that you could get it or you're going to get it? No. Yeah, the answer is no. The simple answer is no. And that's because Alzheimer's is what we call sporadic. Sporadic means that it does not run in families. So for, mo for the most part, Alzheimer's is a sporadic disease. Now, we're going to get into what can what could bring on Alzheimer's, what makes you more at risk of getting Alzheimer's. Remember, to date, as of today, there is no cure for dementia or Alzheimer's. But we certainly have treatments now to help with people that do have these diseases. And they're, they're working hard and hard and hard at coming up with a cure. So they really have to figure out, well, why does this happen in people? So they haven't figured that out yet, but they do know it's a combination of a few things, which we're going to get into. But for anybody in the call or anybody listening out there who has like a, a uh, an interest in Alzheimer's and maybe a, a personal experience with it, I don't want to downplay the hereditary type of Alzheimer's because there is such a thing around 5% have hereditary Alzheimer's. And we call that familial, familial meaning runs in family, like family, familial. So around 5%. So what do I mean? I mean, I, a mother, a father, a brother or a sister, direct family members. So if you have a mother, father or sibling that has Alzheimer's, your chance of getting it does go up. Remember, it is... Now, and also just to go one step further, because I've had I've had a few people in the class who know a lot about Alzheimer's and they, they probably know more than I do. If you have more than one family member, direct family member with Alzheimer's, your chance does escalate. But 
the the good news is for most of us, because I think most of us are 50 years old or are older. If you have if you have this type of familial Alzheimer's that is genetic, it's, you've got the genetic disposition that the gene is in your DNA and it's been passed down to you. Typically, your symptoms have shown up already in like your 30s and in your 40s and in your 50s. So if you if you're 60 something and you haven't had any any kind of significant symptoms that you could put your finger on and say, yeah, that could be dementia, then likely you haven't expressed those genes and, and are going to get Alzheimer's. So keep that in mind. I really want you to, to feel that, but I want to, I always make that clear now when I do this, because I, I want one class I had, I had a lady who did have a lot of experience and she had it running in her family and, you know, she had a few things to say about it. So I don't want to downplay that it can't, that it, that it uh, can be familial or hereditary. Same sort of means the same thing. Okay. Thank you, John, for the, uh, the, uh, messages you're putting in the chat. That's really helpful to, to all of us. So if we know that sporadic Alzheimer's, so not running in families type of Alzheimer's is the largest portion, uh, why does it happen? Why, why do people, why does your neighbor get Alzheimer's and you don't get Alzheimer's? Why does the, um, you know, family members that live in Texas get Alzheimer's and you're not getting in, you're in Washington? Why, why is that? Well, the, the, Typical sporadic Alzheimer's is it happens due to a complex combination of three, the three things. So our genes can play a role, right? We just learned that our environment and our lifestyle. So three things. Now, when I heard that, when I studied this, I felt relief. I felt a, I felt a bit of relief because I thought, okay, if I'm okay with the genes, my lifestyle and my environment, I feel like those are in my control. I can make a difference. I can change some things that might not be very um, healthy. So that's good news. Great news for all of us. So let's move on to looking at the risk factors. And we'll move, we'll come back to that, those three things again, so we can really dial in and really understand it you know, to the point that you can uh, teach this to somebody else. That's my intent. Whenever I teach classes, whatever I teach you, I'm going to teach it to you from different angles so that you really, really understand it so that you could actually express and, 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 and teach somebody else. And that's the best way to get it into your brain and, and to remember, remind yourself and remember certain things is to teach others what you've just learned. So I, I do encourage you to uh, share this knowledge with somebody. I come back to the class again for a refresher and just check and see if you if you missed anything. I do give out two handouts with this class at the end of the class. One is going to have the list of all the risk factors and the little description about what it means. And the other handout is going to be on the top 10 optimal brain health foods. So you get two handouts from this uh, class. So just so you know. So risk factors. Can anybody explain what a risk factor is? It, it, it's, you probably kind of have a sense and an idea what a risk factor is, but it's sometimes hard to put it in words, like to be succinct and, and say exactly what the word means, but you kind of have an idea. So risk factors are the characteristics of, and here's those three things again, your lifestyle, your environment, and your genetic background that increase your likelihood of getting a disease. So risk factors are always relating to medical conditions or diseases. So risk factor, what's your risk factor of getting heart disease? What's your risk factor of diabetes? Well, I have a pretty high risk factor of diabetes because I have family history with diabetes and it can run in families. What's your risk factor for dementia? And that's what we're gonna learn today. It's the increases your likelihood of getting this disease. It increases your probability of getting the disease. It increases your chance of getting the disease. So that's, so think of it that way. It doesn't mean because you have this, you're going to get this or because you don't have this, you're not going to get this, right? Like it's, it's, it's the probability it increases. Now, if you can keep your risk factor down low, your risk factor total down low, you're setting yourself up for success. Not necessarily that you're not going to get it, but you sure are making a big effort to not get it. So 
there's 12 to 13 risk factors we're going to talk about today. Let's get out of the way the ones that are out of our control. Two things. Genetics, you know, for the most part, what we're dealt in our DNA is kind of what we're stuck with. We might have a strong longevity gene. That's good. If you want to live long, a long life, you might have a strong, uh, I don't know, in genetics, things like personality, I think, can get passed down as well. Maybe there's stubborn and stubbornness in your family and you've, you've got that too, like never give up that kind of attitude. I think that you can have some, some things in your genes on that. The other, the other thing is age. Unfortunately, it doesn't matter how rich or poor we are. We all age. And, uh, we always, we all have birthdays. 365 days later, we have another birthday. <clears throat> doesn't matter how, if you're a billionaire and you don't want to age anymore. Maybe you try, you know, potions and lotions <laughs> to keep yourself young, but, but you know what? They're still turning another year older. So let's look at what is in our control. The first one is blood pressure. Blood pressure, because blood pressure can be hereditary, sometimes we might not think of ourselves as having high blood pressure. We're Say we're of optimal weight, you know, we exercise, we eat the right foods, but our blood pressure could be high and you need to get it checked. So either you check it at home and you have like a, um, a blood pressure cuff not, not too hard to figure out how to use. I mean, I'm a nurse, so I learned how to do it in school, but it's not that difficult. Uh, when the stores open up and we can get beyond this COVID out, you know, pandemic, the, the ones by the pharmacy, you know, where you put your little arm into the sleeve and you can test it, you know, for free while you're waiting for your prescription or those things have, most of those things have been closed because of uh, COVID. Uh, going to your doctor and getting your blood pressure checked and just making sure you're within the norms. So here's the risk factor. If you have high blood pressure, you are at higher risk of, of uh, developing dementia, period. It's been studied, it's scientifically proven. Higher blood pressure, if you're in the high blood pressure, you have a higher risk of dementia. Now, what can you do about it? Well, you can do a lot. Get it checked out, get it taken care of. If you need to go on medication because your doctor's recommending it, that would be your consideration. Um, if you take any of my other classes, I have a class on natural <clears throat> remedies and we discuss natural ways to bring your blood pressure down if you have high blood pressure. So there's a class, natural remedies. Um, I'm teaching natural remedies again next week on Thursday. So if you if you wanna check that out. Um, a little, a little uh, tip for any classes of mine I only teach on Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays. So that'll save you from looking for health classes of mine on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. So for the, for the foreseeable future, those are the days that I teach. So the good news about blood pressure is you get, if you get it taken care of, if you take care of it, you get onto medication or whatever your doctor's recommending and you bring it back into the normal range, you have now taken care of that risk factor. You can give a green check mark next to that one and you do not have to worry about that one as long as you manage your, your blood pressure. Smoking is a harsh one, I'm gonna say. So if anybody smokes here or you know somebody that smokes, you can tell them that they have a 45% higher chance of getting dementia because they smoke. That's frightening because 45%, is, I mean, even if it was 5%, that's like, would you want to be that extra 5%? No, 45% more chance of getting, developing dementia if you smoke. So, so the good news is if you stop smoking within, you know, a few months, you end up in the camp of the non-smokers. So ex-smokers and non-smokers are in the same camp. This is not a problem. So even if you've smoked for 20 years, you can, if you can get the right support and help, you can quit smoking and get rid of that risk factor. The next one is cholesterol levels. Again, think of the blood pressure. If you go to the doctor and your doctor says, yeah, your cholesterol levels are not looking good and you need to get it down into the norm, just know that when you keep having a high cholesterol level in your body and yeah, I like the fatty foods, ah, you know, I'm fairly healthy. I'm just going to keep on eating and who cares if my cholesterol level is a bit elevated. You do care because it will, you can develop dementia because of it. So 
if you take care of it, you, you, you change your lifestyle, you maybe go on a little bit of medication like Lipitor or something to bring your cholesterol, bad cholesterol levels down, then you are taking care of that risk factor. Now I will comment about cholesterol since I have your attention. There is good cholesterol as well. And we want to have good cholesterol. Without the HDL good cholesterol, we would die. Okay, our body cannot, wouldn't be able to um, survive because we need good cholesterol. The good cholesterol is like, it kind of lubricates our bodies and helps with a lot of body processes. So when I mention cholesterol levels, I mean that overall ratio, if your LDL, which is the bad and the HDL, which is the good is, you know, out of whack and this one's higher, then you've got bad ratio, like the bad cholesterol, but you want to be able to go like this and get that good HDL up there. And we'll talk a little bit about that at the end with the brain foods. What can you do to improve your HDL cholesterol? All right, moving on to the next one, obesity and physical uh, exercise. They kind of go hand in hand. If you, if you know somebody who is quite overweight, which, you know, they categorize that as obese, they probably likely don't move their body very much. They don't have a lot of movement. So probably more of a sedentary lifestyle. So again, you are at higher risk of developing dementia if you are obese and or you are sedentary. You don't, you don't move your body. Now, over this last year, 2020, a lot of us have slowed down. Uh, well, I would say maybe that first year, because weren't we all frightened? I was frightened. I was at home. I was scared to go out. I was like, uh, even if the gym was open, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to be around anybody. I would scoot out for a walk at 630 in the morning. So I wouldn't bump into anybody. I see somebody coming on the, on the sidewalk. I'd cross the street. Like I was terrified. I was quite scared. Like, what does this pandemic thing mean? So a lot of us started to become more sedentary because we we're spending more time in our homes and not all of us have a big house with a, you know, built in gym. And I mean, I live in a two bedroom condo. It's not that big. So Again, if you can think of ways to change your lifestyle, improve your environment, get the weight down to a more manageable weight. I'm not saying we're all going to be size zeros. I'll never, ever be a size zero. But if we can move our bodies and, and, and help ourselves to release the weight we don't need. And I say release, I don't say loss because I don't want it back, right? You don't want it back. So you say release, you've released that weight. You want to release the weight then you will set yourself up for more success. All right, the next one is diet. We're going to talk a lot about the foods towards the end, but diet. What people who actually have an unhealthy diet are at higher risk of developing dementia. And why is that? Because if you have a poor diet, you are more prone to di type 2 diabetes, you're more prone to cardiovascular disease, so heart disease, you're more prone to dementia, because those things are risk factors for dementia. So uh, what's a poor diet? High, high bad fats, high sugars, high uh, salt, which comes in all the processed. Um, maybe you feel like you're eating healthy because you're eating the little frozen dinners uh, you take to lunch and you're only eating so many calories. But think about that processed packaging. First of all, there's all the plastic packaging. Secondly, there's probably 10 times the amount of sodium you probably are needing. Packaged foods are done and packaged uh, in a certain way to, to preserve it. And so they put a lot of, a lot of salt and a lot of other stuff in there. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about your diet. And that's one of the positives, I guess, from we're all kind of stuck at home a little bit more. Are you cooking more? Are you actually taking the fresh broccoli and steaming it yourself instead of buying it in like one of those packaged dinners? Maybe, maybe you are. I'm definitely cooking more than I, I did uh, the previous years for sure. All right, alcohol. Now, alcohol is a kind of a tricky one because what I'm going to say to you is it's the people that drink excessively that are at higher risk of dementia. I'm not referring to the social drinker or the even the moderate drinker, somebody who maybe uh, has a, a glass of wine, maybe every second meal they have a glass of wine. Um, they like to socialize with their friends and they have a few drinks. That's not who I'm referring to. I'm referring to the people that excessively drink. So if you have to have a drink every day, maybe you are excessively drinking throughout 
throughout the week, like in, in, the, in total, do you binge drink on the weekend after work? You, you know, you kick back on Friday nights and you, you have your half a case of beer or whatever. I'm going to leave the definition to you, but here's, here's how I define it. Do you have freedom from alcohol? It's kind of like the question of food freedom as well. Do you have freedom from eating candy? I'll give you that example. Say you're at work, somebody's put out this display of all the sugary candies that they got from maybe it's post Halloween, or let's just say they just treated everybody. They went to the dollar store. We have the dollar stores up here and they bought a bunch of candy and they put it out there and it's on display in the kitchen at, at work. All right. Can you, could you go to the kitchen and not grab that free piece of candy? That's the thing. It's free. It's sitting there. No, it, Nobody's in the kitchen. You're in there by yourself. You went to get your glass of water or your coffee. You see all this free candy. Do you take a scoop of that and stick it in your pocket? Maybe you, you squirrel it away for later. If you don't have food freedom, it means you couldn't let it go. You would have to pick up something. If you have food freedom, you might go, you know what? Not this time. You say to yourself, mm, not this time. I don't need the candy. Same thing with alcohol. If somebody take, goes out, you go out for... Um, to visit a friend and and they're buying oh let me buy i'm buying and say you decide you didn't want to drink would you have to have that drink hey it's free do you see what i mean by freedom if you can say no not this time then you have freedom from it it's not it's not uh, taking you over so i would use that as part of your definition if you think you might excessively drink but anyways the bottom line is higher risk of developing dementia if you are ex an excessive drinker all right, levels of formal education. How do I describe this one? This is more about that use it or lose it mentality. If you are a lifelong learner and you keep your brain tuned up, you know, your brain's tuned up, you use it, you, you don't overuse it, but you, you make sure you use it. You're always doing a project or you're learning a new language or you're, you're taking a course, you're here on Get Set Up. Uh, I think all of us lifelong learners on Get Set Up, we're, we're actively using our brain. What happens when you do that is your body creates a cognitive reserve and the cognitive meaning, for, you know, brain power reserve. So if something were to happen, like say you did get sick or, you know, you weren't able to do something for a while, you've kind of got this little reserve that your body can like tap into. So you're not going to just lose it. And now you've got dementia. So they say people that have this um, lifelong learning keeps their brain in better shape. It's kind of like when, say you you say you fall and you break your leg, but you heal so fast. The doctor's amazed, like, oh my gosh, you're, you healed so fast. How did you do that? Oh, well, I've been taking health and wellness classes that get set up. And uh, I've been eating all my nutrients and getting my mega threes and all my stuff. So my body was in prime shape. And unfortunately, I slipped on the ice and fell and, you know, broke my leg. But look how fast I'm healing. So that's the difference. Same thing when it comes to the education and our brains. Um, the next one is depression. Depression, the, the, the jury's, okay, researchers think of it in two different camps. One camp thinks that depression is actually just a um, symptom, early symptom of dementia. So you get depression, that's an early symptom that you are eventually going to develop dementia. Now, the other camp feel that, um, that depression is a, just a risk factor for it makes it more more chance that you're going to get dementia and some kind of think it's both so in any event dement, uh, depression is not you want to take care of your depression if you're if you're finding you have seasonal depression make sure you that you take care of it so don't just the, the people that don't seek help sit in their their medical condition and then sometimes it causes permanent damage for example if you have high blood pressure and you keep that high blood pressure and you don't get it checked out and you just you you, you ignore going to the doctor you can have permanent heart damage so depression can give you some permanent uh health issues if you don't get take care of it so it's a good reason to to take care of if you have depression head injuries I feel like head injuries is pretty self-explanatory. Anybody who gets a severe hit, hit, hit to their head or repeated hits to their head are at higher risk of developing dementia. Where do we see this? Does something come to mind when you think of head injuries? Anything? I kind of try to 
to not watch those sports because they're not, I, I just find them kind of not interesting to me, but Hey, you know, who knows, John, maybe, yeah, I don't know, John, there's women that like football too, but there's a lot of men like watching football and, um, rugby is big here in Canada. What about soccer? Soccer? Well, they call it football in other countries. Soccer is big, but what are these guys, you see these guys playing and there's all a bunch of them around the ball and then they all jump up together and one person hits the ball and somebody else's head hits the other person's head. Like they, those are physical um, sports. Repeated head injury can you gives you a, a higher risk of, of developing dementia. So if you're going to ride a bike, make sure you wear a helmet. When you're going to ride a bike, make sure you've got your helmet on correctly. You know, if you fall, does the helmet fall off because you had it on your head too loose? Like, don't put it there for show. Wear it properly. Um, the next one on hearing loss is sort of think about the blood pressure and the cholesterol. So hearing loss, if you have hearing loss and you, you, you wear a hearing aid or you have something to aid your hearing, then you've, you've taken care of that risk factor. But if you have hearing loss and you don't take care of it, slowly you will find that that individual will slowly retreat and become isolated. So you go to a family event. Yeah, it's just you and, you know, Joe, you're talking to Joe, you can hear him. Now the grandkids have come in the room. Now there's five different voices. Now you can't hear anything. So what do you do? You sort of retreat to the corner. My dad used to do that a little bit. So that they, they feel there is a connection. They've done research on this, that people that have hearing loss and they don't take care of it can tend to develop dementia more often than somebody with, with normal hearing. Because you just tend to isolate yourself. You're not hearing the right stuff on the TV. You're missing things. Your, your, your day-to-day is not as fruitful as it could be if you had the proper hearing. The last two I find very fascinating. And I'm going to just say, we need to have a good night's sleep every single night. One bad night and it can ruin your week. We all have had that. I've had that where I, I drank uh, caffeine too late in the day. I had too many worries because of my work. Um, I had hormones fluctuating because of or before menopause. I mean, you name it. Maybe you stayed up too late because you were binge watching Netflix and now uh, you can't sleep because your mind is racing. You're thinking about the movie and how the, and the movie could have ended a different way. Like I have many different reasons why I might stay up at night, but we need proper sleep. And the big reason is because our bodies do a lot of cleansing at night, refreshing. Our brain actually cleanses the neurons at night. And if you don't get into that deep sleep, your brain can't do it. So very important to, to get proper sleep. So you're body can clean and do its cleansing at night. The last one is very interesting. I left it for last because I, I just didn't, I don't know, I didn't really understand it. And I thought, well, I don't quite get it. But the thing about this is if you live near a busy road, I'm going to say from the research, it said 50 meters. So if you're in a country that uses meters, 50 meters, if you're in a country that uses feet, is about 164 feet away. So kind of judge it. Now I live on a medium busy road here, but I am now more conscientious that in the summer when I have my balcony door open, you might not smell it right away. You might not even see it because it's tiny little particles. It's the pollution from the cars and the trucks that seep into our homes. And they, they, there's a correlation. They feel that if you are ingesting this pollution, you are at higher risk of developing dementia. Isn't that one fascinating? Yeah, I find that fascinating. So think about it also when you're out for a walk, you're trying to do your body good. And now you're walking on the side of a busy road. And are you just sniffing in, taking in all the pollution? So pollution a, is a biggie. So you might not live near a busy road, but maybe you go jogging or you go walking or you cycle on a busy road. Think about, think about maybe changing where you do your cycling. Okay, so we're doing good here. Um, so think, so we've talked about the three things. What are the three things again? Genetics? Lifestyle. And so... Genetics, lifestyle, and environment. Those are the three things. 
Now, this is how you can explain it to your neighbor or your husband or spouse or partner or child. This is what you've learned today. Hey, dementia, there's a, the chance of getting it is based on those three things. And if you, now that you understand all the risk factors and you're going to get a handout on this, think of your brain. If it gets overwhelmed with too many risk factors, your brain can't do its daily repair. It can't do its daily flushing. It can't clean up and keep the brain nice and clean because those little particles that are called amyloid betas, what they do is they get stuck in the neurons, like pretend I'm touching my brain. They get stuck in the neurons and they turn into plaque. And we all know they don't have a cure yet for dementia and Alzheimer's, but they have seen plaque on the brains of autopsies of people with with dementia and Alzheimer's. So we know that we wanna keep our neurons clean. So it's basically your brain gets overwhelmed. There's too many, there's too many risk factors uh, affecting our brains. All right, so let's look at what can we do for brain health? Let's get to the positives now. Like all that was positive in the sense you can change it, but let's look at the positives here physically active, move your body, get your body moving. That will help reduce your risk of getting dementia. It doesn't matter what you do. You can do some strength training. You can go swimming. You can ride bikes with your grandkids. Um, you can do yoga. You can do stretching on the floor or in your bed in the morning. You can do some stretches just to get your body kind of um, feeling flexible. The second way to improve our brain health is to be socially active. And why is that? Well, when you're socially active, you're listening to stories, you're learning new things, you are, um, you're sharing ideas, you're teaching others something, you're having interaction with other humans. That's really important. It's a little tricky right now, so maybe you have to do a Zoom call with your family and catch up on uh, on on, on a, in a Zoom call. Uh, maybe you meet and talk to your neighbor, but from a distance, you chat with them across the across the way. Being socially active keeps our brains um, in a good shape. Oh, Leslie is asking. Um, Leslie is asking about how is it. How is it um, diagnosed? So as a nurse, I wouldn't necessarily diagnose somebody with dementia, but your doctor will diagnose somebody with dementia. So if you're worried even for yourself, not to, not to, not to fret, your doctor has um, a certain, like there's no blood test. There is no blood test, but on autopsy, they have checked and they see that there's plaque in, in a lot of the brains of people with dementia. I mean, I suppose you could get a PET scan or a scan of your brain, but they're not just going to put you into a machine to get a, uh, a brain scan just because you think you might have dementia. They would ask all the questions like they might even do recall things with you. Like, you know, here's five numbers. Can you recall them? They do a battery of tests to, to tell if somebody has dementia and there's specific things they can test to see if you've got Alzheimer's. So I would leave that to your doctor. That's who I would go to. All right, let's just keep moving along here. Challenging your brain is the third thing to help with brain health. Challenge your brain. Like um, I have two violins in our home. Like we're kind of musical, me and my husband. We were taking violin lessons in 2015 and then we did it for a year and then we stopped. Well, I didn't grow up learning the violin like my husband. So I've forgotten everything to do with the violin. I don't think I could squeak out even a note on it, but I want to do it again because I kind of got my brain thinking differently. I've never used instruments with um, with strings. Well, I have guitar, but I'm a piano player. I learned piano growing up. So try something new, like maybe you've never crocheted, take up crocheting, um, find a class on Get Set Up of something you've never ever thought to do before and, and learn a new skill. All those things challenge our brains. Like I'm not a big chess player and I probably never would be good at it. That's how I feel. but. Maybe one day I'll actually learn how to play chess properly. All right. The fourth thing is embracing a healthy diet. We're going to get to the foods in a sec. So limiting your processed foods, limiting your processed meats and sweets and dairy, all of those things can affect your brain. The reason I say dairy here, and I'll, I'll just be clear because some people might be very pro-dairy. Dairy generally is an inflammatory food for most people. So what does that mean? It means it adds inflammation into your body. So think of anything. If anything inside you is festering with an inflammation, turning into an infection, 
Do you think that that could be the precursor to a disease? Absolutely. So we wanna keep our insides nice and clean and, and, and low in inflammation, no redness and tenderness. So we want to keep that down. So there's lots of anti-inflammatory foods and also including our brain. So we're gonna to get to those foods in a moment. Think about eating the rainbow. That's the best way to think of it. Making conscious and safe choices. So if you're gonna go out and cut the lawn and there might be rocks on the lawn, wear eye protection, wear ear protection. If you're going to a concert or, you know, um, you like to listen to your music really loud, but do you need it to have it that loud? So protect your, protect your eyes and your ears. Managing our stress is super important. Uh, what can I say about this? If you're stressed, do you sleep well? If you're stressed, probably not. Um, what about just taking some good care, uh, self-care for ourselves? That's really important. And then the, the last part about the managing stress is seek and, 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 and accept help. If your neighbor wants to help you with something, let them help. They're getting just as much satisfaction and help from it than as you are. So if somebody wants to help you with something, especially now, you know, we're in the second half of our life, right? So if the 20 year old across the street wants to always bring your garbage cans in, let them do it. Thank them, you know, have a conversation, uh, but let them do it. And now we're on to the brain foods. This is this is the brain foods part. So a, a, a mentor of mine, his name is Jim Quick. He's written as his first book called Limit. I think it's his first Limitless. Limitless is what it's called. Maybe um, John can look it up. His name's Jim Quick. It's up on the screen. Limitless. He is a brain brain guy. He is this kid that had a brain injury when he was young and he had a hard, tough, tough time through school. He had to try 10 times harder than anybody else to like, you know, get through school. And then he's made it his lifelong mission because it's his passion to explore the brain. How do we memorize things better? How do we use our brain more powerfully? How do we keep our brains in really good health? This is his top 10 foods. So here we go. The first one, does it surprise you? Avocado. Why is avocado on the, on the, on the list here? Because of the monounsaturated fats, the good healthy fats. Our brain needs healthy fats. This is where that cholesterol part comes in too. Our brains need good cholesterol. Our brains need healthy fats. Where do we get healthy fats from? One of the big sources, avocado. Now you can eat avocado however you want. In, in Australia, they, they smash it on toast. Well here, sorry, millennials love avocado. They smash it on toast. It gives them brain power when they're like in their corporate meetings. In Australia, they put Vegemite down on their toast first. If anybody doesn't know what Vegemite is, you can look it up. It's like a, it's, it looks like, it looks black. It's like a salty, it's an acquired taste. Uh, my mom grew up in Australia, so I'm used to it. So they smother their Vegemite on their toast and then they put their avocado smashed on top. I'm telling you, it is delicious. Um, blueberries, Jim Quick calls them brain berries. Blueberries are fantastic for your brain. Fresh, frozen, doesn't matter. Pull it out, put it on your oatmeal, put it in your smoothie, eat it like candy, freeze it and eat it like little um, frozen pebbles. It, it's just absolutely fantastic for your brain. Broccoli, our, our brains love broccoli. Uh, you can make broccoli different ways. I put a bit of broccoli actually in my, my vegetable smoothie in the morning because I'm trying to get more greens into my diet. But I love steamed broccoli. You can put a little bit of sprinkle of cheese on it if you want. Uh, it's huge in fiber, so it really helps to clean your body. Coconut oil, again, healthy fat. Do not be afraid of the saturated part of coconut oil. Coconut has been around for since our ancestors' time, right? Coconuts have been around a long time. So it is a food that our body knows how to deal with. Like the, our bodies know how to deal with coconut. Like some of these newer foods, our body might not know quite how to process it. Our bodies really know how to process coconut. So whether you get fresh coconut, you drink coconut water in your smoothie or, or separate, um, you cook with coconut oil, a great oil to cook with because it has a high smoking point. And what does that mean? It means that you are not going to damage the oil if you turn it up on high because you're frying uh, fish in it or you're doing a stir fry. If you did that with olive oil, which is a very good oil, and you get higher than a medium heat, you've now smoked it. 
And that means it's oxidized and it's like a toxin if you put that in your body. So what if that ever happens in your pan and it starts to smoke, turn it off or move that pan right off it. Do not use that pan until you've cleaned it and it's cooled down and you've cleaned it. <clears throat> Excuse me, start over. So that's what I can say about coconut oil. Coconut oil also helps you do some fat burning. So if you have a little bit of weight to release, coconut oil is a great sort of weight loss hack. You eat coconut oil and give yourself some good fat in your body. Your body is more uh, able to release the fat. It's when we stop putting any fat in our bodies. Guess what our body does if you don't eat any fat, the good fat? Hey, it's going to hold on to all that fat on you because it's scared. You're not going to give it any. So it's kind of like you give it a little bit of good fat. It will release the, the fat that you're carrying around. Eggs is another, um, excuse me, eggs is another really, really important brain food. I used to always have scrambled eggs before writing an exam when I was in university because it made me feel good. And I didn't know the connection to this at that time, but there is a memory um, improving um, uh, thing in eggs called choline and so it actually helps your memory omega-3s and vitamin e really high green leafy vegetables you hear that all the time but there is some real truth to green leafy vegetables eat it however you can here's a tip this is what i do i take my green leafy vegetables like my kale i've even done it with with lettuces if it's going a little bit old and i'm going to travel or something you take your cookie sheet you put your parchment paper down you lay down your green green leaf maybe you have a garden lay down your green leafy vegetables fresh is always nice but and then stick that in the freezer freeze the individual lettuce pieces separate and then when it's all frozen gather it up quickly put it in a ziploc or freezer bag and throw it back in the freezer so next time you're going to make a smoothie put that frozen piece of kale or celery or lettuce or not celery, lettuce or whatever it is. And when it's frozen, it will chop up way better in your mixer than if it was a soft piece of a leaf that would just probably get stuck in the motor. So that's how you, that's how you crunch up and, and slice up a green leafy vegetable. Maybe you've got an extra amount in your house. So you throw it in the, you throw it in the freezer, freeze it individual, and then you put it all in a, in a bag. If you're, if you're having troubles getting your green leafy vegetables. Um, sorry, salmon's the next one. And salmon, because of the omega-3s, it is that wild-caught salmon is just packed full of beautiful omega-3s. Your, your brain absolutely loves it. So you're getting a, a little bit of a, a clue here that the brain needs really good, healthy fats. So for any of you who have done those really, really low fat diets, do you remember when we had, that was a bit of fat, low fat, um, I don't know, low fat. I, I, I just can think of the low fat. They always blamed it on fat. Meanwhile, we're eating all these sugary processed foods. But anyways, we used to blame it on fat. Do you remember how your brain couldn't work, function very well when you had low fat? Like you weren't very smart, were you? Like you had brain fog possibly. We need these good fats. Salmon's a great source. The last three brain foods, turmeric. I've talked about turmeric in other classes. Turmeric is like a powerful, powerful spice. You can throw it in just about anything. Start with a little pinch. It's very yellowy. It will change the color of your oatmeal if you put it in. It will change the color of your soup if you put it in your soup. I use it in dal. If you've taken my seven healing food class, you'll get a really beautiful recipe for it. It's like a pea soup. It's an Indian pea soup called dal and it is an, a great immune booster and it brings down that inflammation very quickly if you have turmeric and we need to make sure that our brain doesn't get inflamed either because it can um, cause cause problems walnuts are great because they've got magnesium in them and it helps to improve our mood and it also has omega-3s in it I don't have it written there, but it does. And then the last one, I thought I'd put a little bit of fun so we don't feel like it's all leafy greens and, you know, life is over because I don't get to eat anything fun. Dark chocolate. Look for, you know what? Demand the good chocolate wherever you live and they will start to bring that chocolate in instead of some of the crappy stuff that has full of extra sugars. And I don't know, doesn't it even taste like plastic to you when I eat like plain regular chocolate it doesn't even taste like chocolate to me anymore maybe i'm just gotten a bit of a snob when it comes to chocolate look for 70 percent or higher 
for your chocolate. Now I'll admit the 80 and above is pretty bitter. Like I think they have to add some sugar to it because it's so bitter because chocolate like cacao is raw, raw chocolate, cacao, C-A-C-A-O, uh, I think it is spelled. Cocoa, what's the difference between cocoa and cacao? Cacao is the raw form of cocoa. Cocoa has been um, roasted, like it's been, you know, handled. So the raw cacao, and then you'll see it in stores, is your best true chocolate. So you can even get that powder and uh, make a dessert with that. So you don't have to buy the chocolate bar that can be quite expensive. All right, so um, a bonus. This is the bonus, your brain needs water. I should be drinking faster than I am, but sipping is great. Sip your water throughout the day is awesome. Our brain and our body is 75-ish percent made up of water, so we need water. Your brain needs the water to do its flushing when it's doing that flushing at night. So if you're, if you're dehydrated, your, your brain's kind of trying to do its cleaning and it's like this going, oh, she didn't have enough water. So I don't have enough water to do my proper cleaning. So I'm going to just, it's like, it's like cleaning your garage sweeping, but you have no water to really clean the, like the, the parts that you really want. You can only sweep and get rid of a bit of the dust. That's sort of like, think of it that way. Okay. Well, we are at the end of the class and um, let me just check here. So we've learned the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's, right? Dementia is the umbrella. Alzheimer's is one of the ones underneath. We've learned many risk factors. On, my, on the list I give you, there's actually a 13th one. So you can see if, which one we didn't talk about is on the list. You'll get a handout for that. And then the optimal brain health foods, you're going to get a handout for that as well. It'll be sent out in a post email to you. And um, look out for some new classes. Like every, every week they add brand new classes. So if you're looking for something, you know, keep checking out, check and see what's new. Uh, I have a few new classes. I'm hoping to get my food lifestyle class out there. And that's talking about the different types of eating that we do, like vegan versus vegetarian, keto, uh, Mediter Mediterranean lifestyle. Like what do all these things mean? That's a really great class coming up soon. It's not on the schedule yet. And We also, so you're going to get the post email. You'll see that I'm going to have, you're going to have this little button to do your feedback. Please do the feedback. You, you, you rate the class from a one to a five star and you can give comments, uh, specific comments that you would like to see to improve the class. We always want to improve. I always want to improve. We have a button now when you sign up for a class, it gives you this little pop-up button, invite a friend. It's kind of fun because you can invite a friend of yours. Now, I'm not sure how exactly it works. I think if you click it, you might have to put your friend's email. Um, I'm not 100% because I haven't tried it, but I will try it. Next time I sign up for a class, I will try that. And if you'd like to host an interest group, interest group, there, there, there have been some, um, it's like a volunteer thing and you can do an interest group. There's a gentleman named Dick something, uh, Hewitt, I think he does the diabetes interest group every Monday at 5 PM Pacific standard Pacific time. And I went to that class and it was really, it was really interesting because he talks about a different topic on the topic of your, of your choice. Um, if you want to suggest a new class or you want the recording, get set up dot io does anybody have any questions before we end today you're welcome sherry i'm so glad to have you here come and come again any any kind of lingering questions you're thinking about with the brain how about you elizabeth you feeling good feeling like you're i'm feeling good yes <laughs> yeah and, and you know, it, it's, it's fun. Like I've, I've noticed there's quite a few people that will take my class more than once. I love it. You know, I sometimes might say the same story because I feel that story is what uh, really um, uh, brings, brings together the point I'm trying to make. Sometimes I have a different story. I, I don't know. Maybe you hear the same story twice and you really remember it. I know that uh, John just put in the chat uh, in regards to Dick's interest group dealing with diabetes. Yeah, this guy has diabetes and he knows a lot about it. I asked him tons of questions, but stay tuned. I am creating a diabetes management and remission class, which 
I'm still trying to figure out the title because I didn't want to just say diabetes reversal, but I think I might even call it type two, sorry, type two diabetes reversal. I feel like I want to call it that because everything I'm going to talk about is how you can reverse your symptoms. Uh, you know, there's no cure for diabetes, but in any event, there's a real big relation between diabetes and getting dementia. So that's the risk factor, hint, hint, that is going to be on your, on your sheet that I didn't actually talk about today. So if everybody is good, Jennifer, Leslie, Margaret, anybody have a, a question you want to ask me while you have my attention? No? Okay. Well, thank you for being here. Um, I look forward to having you in another class of mine. Uh, have a really wonderful weekend, and I hope you can get out and do some gardening, maybe, if you're a gardener. I'm so excited for the, the warmer weather. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.